Paul spotted someone in the crowd and he said, that's my jumper. She's wearing my jumper. <laughs> what? This is ridiculous. Hi to everybody. Welcome to the first Ask Patty session. And thank you so much to everyone who sent in the questions that we were asking for towards the end of last year. Been a little bit delayed because of COVID and all the other situations that we have, but we're finally here. So, um, hi to Patty. Good morning to you, Patty. Good morning, Tony. I think the first question I've got to ask is, how are you? I'm absolutely fine. You know, I don't mind uh, this COVID situation for me because I'm in the country and I'm right. doing lots of gardening and walking the dog and cooking up recipes. But oh, I know it's a nightmare for most of the majority of people. Yeah, yeah, we're getting towards the end of it, hopefully. And uh, you hopefully. had your first vaccine. Any, any sign of a second one? N no, I've just had the first one yeah. on the 30th of January. So I think the next one should be coming up quite soon. Good, good to hear it. OK, well, we looked at all the questions and we had hundreds, and I do mean hundreds of questions. So thank you to everybody for those. And we tried to pull them together. Um, today on this session, we'll probably be focusing more on the music side of things with Patty. Um, so yes, let's just dive straight in. I was really interested with the cross section. There's some great questions in here. So Patty, we'll just dive straight in. First question I've got for you here, aside from the obvious songs that were written for you, and I'm guess by obvious, then the, the person's meaning something, Layla, wonderful tonight. Were there any other songs by George and Eric that were written, but we perhaps don't know about or perhaps not quite so well known? Um, yes, there was one written by Eric called um, Bell Bottom Blues and another one called Old Love, which okay. he wrote when he and I were sort of having a rather bad time before we split up. Um, as a beautiful song though. And yeah. I think that George wrote Isn't It a Pity? I think he wrote that about us. When you listen to it again, listen to the lyrics, it makes sense to me because it was a pity too. Yeah, yeah. You always cite that as perhaps one of your favourite songs, don't you? I know I've asked you that. that I do. Well. It's a very beautiful, beautiful, um, compassionate song. Yeah. And I think most people would be able to relate to it when, when a relationship breaks down, sadly. Yeah, we've just gone past the 50th anniversary of All Things Must Pass. And I, I read a lot of commentary about the album, but also that song. And I think a lot of people like that, that's their favourite. So, uh, yeah, you're not alone there, certainly. What about um, I Need You from the Help album that George wrote? Do you, you remember that one? Is there, any, is there an angle on that one? I don't know. I don't know. I've thought about it and I'm not really sure. Um, it, it could be. Yeah. I mean, we were together at that time, so perhaps it was. But you know what? I'm a bit shy. I don't want to assume anything. <laughs> but I, I think, uh, yeah, I think that could have been one of the songs for me. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. Next question. What was your favourite year or decade of music? Oh, that is very difficult. Um, I think 60s and 70s. Yeah. I think of the 60s as from 65 to 75. That, to me, is a decade. I think during that period, it was wonderful, very exciting, a lot of great music. Yeah. yeah great absolutely. music from um, England and also in America. You know, if you think of the Beach Boys and um, great bands coming up, and, and I can't think of them. <laughs> uh, but I know there were a lot during yeah, yeah. that period. Did you ever meet George Best, especially in the 60s, in his heyday? Uh, no, I didn't. No. <laughs> I just love these random questions like that. Because George Best was a bit of a sort of pop star footballer, wasn't he? I don't know if you remember. Uh, yes, he was. He was. I met his wife, Angie. Yeah. But I didn't really meet him. Maybe he didn't go to the clubs that we were going to. I don't yeah. know. No, he probably, he probably did a bit of clubbing, if I know anything about his history. But yeah, your paths just didn't cross. And, and I've got a, a sort of to cut across that, actually. But did, um, did George, was George a football fan? Did he sort of have a follow football at all? Not really. Not really. Eric did, no. but not yeah. George. It's interesting because, um, yeah, the guys from Liverpool, Liverpool being a massive footballing city. And, and 
I think they were sort of maybe told to toe the party line what to say. I remember when Paul, for example, was always asked, do you support Liverpool or Everton? It, it was always like the political answer, well, we support both of them, you know, and it was always sort of like the same. It sounds like a bit of a Brian Epstein generated answer to me, that one. I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, it's covering every, every eventuality by saying that. Yeah, because you, yeah. don't want to, you don't want to alienate yourself from one group of fans, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good, good, good PR answer. But Eric, Eric was more of a football. Was more of a football fan, is he? Yes, Eric really enjoyed football. Yeah. Um, trying to think of the team that he backed, that he absolutely loved. Um, uh, in the north of England, for what reason? I have no idea. Uh, I'll think of the name and let you yeah. know later. Okay. Yeah, OK. And I know he's, he's uh, a big cricket fan as well. Did he used to, he used to a charity cricket match, I think, didn't he? he? was involved in charity cricket? Yes, he was. There would be charity cricket matches in his village called Ripley, where he was born, and he would support the local teams. Yeah. yeah. And also he was friends with um, Ian Botham. So he okay. would get him as a celebrity cricketer to come along every so often. Yeah, I can just imagine the sessions after the game, putting those two together. That must have been quite fun. Huge fun. Yeah. Huge fun. That didn't <laughs> seem as if it would ever stop. <laughs> yeah. Lockdown for all of us. You know, we're doing stuff to, to um, pass the time. I've been trawling through some old music papers. I've got a copy of a Melody Maker from February 1977 here. And it's yeah. all about a, a gig that Eric did in what sounds like a little village hall. Yes. in a place called Cranley. And you've got an honorary mention in that party. Do, do you recall anything about that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I was sort of quite involved with that and because um, we thought it would be a really good idea to have a, a, a charity fundraising event. Yeah. And we found out that the Village Hall would allow this. And we wrote down lots of posters, put them up on trees, put them everywhere. Yeah. And it was the most fantastic gig. It was our local village. And um, everybody came. It was quite wonderful. And then one time he, he played there, my brother-in-law, Mick Fleetwood, was in England with John McVie. And uh, I said to them, please, you must come along too. So they came along. And it was just, it was wonderful. Everybody standing around, half dancing, rushing to the stage, and general sort of um, wonder, wonderful, wonderful music was played. Yeah, I, it just sounds amazing. It's like I've got a vision of this sort of tiny village hall, you know, that normally probably has the WI in it or something like that. And suddenly Eric Clapton's there with Ronnie Lane, you know, playing this, <laughs> this gig. It must have yeah. just been just amazing. Next question again, um, we, we sort of grouped some of these questions together because there was some crossover with people asking, but um, this question is about you going into Abbey Road and your background vocals that you recorded for the song Birthday from the White Album. The question was, was your singing appearance on Birthday a planned moment or was it sort of a spur of the moment thing? I think, do you know, I think it was planned without my knowledge really because when George asked me to come to Abbey Road and uh, we were hanging around in the studio and I didn't, I wasn't really totally aware of what was going on. But then I realised that we were all grouped around a microphone and I was told to sing Birthday with the others. And it was a most scary moment looking at all four Beatles and me and I think there are a few other people there. And it was surreal surreal and I thought oh my god I hope I don't let the show down yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I can't sing I can only sing in the car or the shower and um anyway when I hear that song now I can still hear my voice I can pick it out and I'm sort of, I know my my career was not really to be a singer <laughs> your singing career yeah well I think Yoko was on it as well when she was Yoko at that session maybe yeah, yeah I think she was yeah yeah Yes, and also... Um, and Yellow Submarine. I, I saw him on gonna, that as well. I was just going to ask about that as well, because obviously that would have been before birthday. Uh, was that planned or was that just sort of turn up and, oh, everybody's here, we may as well jump in? Yeah, it was. everybody was there and it was just one of those things that happened where we're all there. We might as well all sing Yellow Submarine. 
yeah. and make a noise and make it sound as if we were having a huge fun time. Yeah. That wasn't too difficult. No, that's probably easier than birthday, wasn't it? Not so much pressure. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And I think there was uh, Marianne Faithful and Brian Jones maybe on that session. Oh, I don't. I can't remember. Um, okay. If you say so, I will. I will agree with you. I've only read it somewhere, but yeah, maybe it's a long time ago now. But there's a good chance they may have been there. And if they were there, they'd have been hooked in as well, wouldn't they? So yeah, yeah they would. That, that may have happened. Um, and leading on from that as well, sort of regarding the Abbey Road, someone's put. I'm curious um, if you were able to see George and the boys at recording sessions. I read for a long time, but wives didn't attend. So I think that's sort of alluding to were you and the other girls sort of asked to stay away or, or just... Or, or... We were. We were definitely asked to stay away. Um, I think that, you know, in a work situation like that, the guys just wanted to be on their own so they could have their own arguments, they could have their own discussions without, you know, the wives, girlfriends being there. And, um, and so that was a sort of unspoken rule, really. That's how it was until Yoko came along. And much to our annoyance, Yoko was allowed in the studio. She was the only one. Uh, while we're sort of talking about that, there's the big Get Back, Let It Be um, project, which I think is now coming out September maybe this year with the, the movie, etc. Uh, have you heard much about that? Do you know much about that project? No, I haven't heard about it, Tony. Tell me, where do you hear all these things? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, September this year, I'm pretty sure um, there'll be lots of activity with the album and, and movie, etc. So, yeah, I'm but, looking forward. I'm really looking forward to seeing the movie. Yeah, really. I understand it is a completely different take on the uh, on the first documentary film. You see, I think all films can be changed dramatically depending on the attitude and depending on what you want to portray. It can be very positive or it can be rather negative. See, in this new one, you don't apparently don't see them arguing so much and it's more of an enjoyable situation. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's how I've read it as well. I think Ringo, probably and Paul have both come out and said, yeah, we had a good time as well. It wasn't all doom and gloom. I think the yes. first movie sort of portrayed it that way, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. So you may even be in it. Is there a chance that you'd, you'd be in the movie or not? Because you're sort of in and out of a studio, I guess, during those sessions. Yeah, I don't know, Tony. I have no idea. I don't think so. No. I don't know. Well, we'll, don't we'll know. Wait but yeah, I think everyone in Beta World is looking forward to that. You know, it's going to be quite a big event later in the year. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's just um, go straight to another sort of question away from that. Patty, do you play any instruments? Um, I play a little bit on my piano, but I'm not a dedicated um, pianist. I don't practice every day, which I should do. And the only way you, that really you can get better is to practice. I find other things to do, which is um, a bit limp, <laughs> really, but I do. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. I didn't know that. Um, okay. Next question. I was just sort of bouncing around here. Yeah. What is your funniest memory with the Beatles? I think maybe being in a limousine with Paul and Jane, George and myself, and we were on our way to a film premiere in Piccadilly Circus. And there were crowds and crowds of people, so the car couldn't move very fast. And then Paul spotted someone in the crowd and he said, that's my jumper. She's wearing my jumper. And we were, what? This is ridiculous. Of all the hundreds of people that were surrounding the car and amongst the traffic, Paul spotted someone wearing one of his jumpers. Oh, that's, that's unreal, isn't it? Just crazy. So what's the question? <laughs> yeah. He jumps out of a car and tries to get it back there. I don't know. <laughs> No, because he couldn't get out. I mean, it was very, it was chock-a-block with people and traffic. Yeah, bedlam. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I could just imagine that sort of reaction <laughs> as well. There's stories about, just what we're talking about, people, the fans back in the day visiting the houses, your house, for example, uh, Paul's up where he's still got his house up in St. John's Wood, having fans in and out of there all the time, apparently. Did, did you 
and George struggle with that down at Kinthorns? Was there lots of people regularly turning up? I would say people turned up maybe once a week. And they were normally really sweet and really charming. And um, George was very gracious and always posed for photographs and signed autographs for them. And it wasn't manic. It was just occasionally. And we were quite a long way away from, you know, the local bus stations or train stations. And so they'd obviously made a huge effort to get to us. And I think George appreciated it. If there'd been more than just the odd couple, then, you know, it would have um, been more difficult to deal with. Yeah, sure. I think that, I think John uh, John certainly did the same thing when he was in Ascot. There's some famous footage of him welcoming a I think it was a Canadian guy that just turned up uh, at Tittenhurst Park, and John invited him in, and it was all in the Imagine documentary. You know, he just basically sat down and gave him some breakfast. You know, and oh, had a good chat with him over the table. Yeah, it's some great yeah. footage. Okay, um, next question we have here: What songs make you smile when they come on the radio or TV or maybe in a movie? Have you got some apart from the Beatles songs that we just we mentioned earlier? Any other songs like that? Uh, I think uh, "Good Vibrations" was absolutely amazing when that first came out. I couldn't believe how extraordinary it was and how amazing and what a, such a great idea and how perfect for the time. Yeah. Yeah, it was groundbreaking, wasn't it? I think there's a bit of um, competition, but probably, I hope, I think, friendly competition with the Beatles and the Beach Boys around about that time, maybe with Paul and uh, Brian Wilson in particular. Oh, really? I don't know, but I remember hearing this. I was at Andrew Lou Andrew Oldham's house. He managed the Stones, and he sort of, there were a few of us at his house. He said, listen to this, you won't believe it. And of course, he cranked up the volume really high. And it was amazing. But yeah. I don't know about Paul and the Beach Boys. I didn't hear that story, rumour, whatever. They were just producing so much groundbreaking material and, and just bouncing off each other by the sound of it around the time of Sergeant Pepper, Pet Sounds. It was just sort of raising the bar every time. It was just phenomenal, phenomenal for everybody. Yes. What is your relationship with Paul and Ringo nowadays? Do you still see them? Well, as we're not allowed to travel, I don't see Ringo because he's in Los Angeles. Yeah. And Paul, um, no, I haven't seen, I spoke to his daughter recently, but I haven't really spoken to him for some time. Yeah, yeah, that's difficult. Everyone's busy, even in lockdown. Well, Paul was busy with his, the album he was making in lockdown. So it's uh, yeah, still busy time for him, I guess. Yeah. Um, now, this next question, when I saw it, it puzzled me a little bit. I, I, I'll ask it to you directly. Um, I'm not sure if you were there. What did Patty think of Woodstock? Well, I thought it was the most wonderful idea. I wasn't there. You, were, no. you went to the big, one of the big Isle of Wight festivals around about that went time. Went to the Isle of Wight when Bob Dylan was playing. Yeah. Have you ever been friends with Stevie Nicks and do you enjoy Fleetwood Mac? Bit of a random question. <laughs> I love Fleetwood Mac. I absolutely love them. And their album Rumours was just the top, top, top for me. I couldn't yeah. stop playing it. And I still play it a lot. And Stevie Nicks is a sweet, sweet girl. I went, I saw them when I was in Australia. And I went, they invited me to the concert. And then Stevie wanted to see me backstage. And it was really lovely to see her. She's such a talented girl. Yeah, um, I think most people echo that rumours, certainly, you know, 70s, it's just like, you know, there with albums like Hotel California by the Eagles, it's always going to be one of the oh, top, Love top the Eagles. Ones. Yeah, I love the Eagles too. Do you get to go to, yeah, you know, when those groups come over, like Fleetwood Mac and the Eagles play these huge stadia gigs at Wembley or whatever, do you get to go to those? Do you enjoy going to those nowadays? Um, yeah, uh... I love the idea of them more than the reality. Yeah. It's just that when you go to huge stadiums, I mean, they look the size of a little mouse, you know, unless you are on stage, on the side of the stage, or very close. But, you know, the thing is, you go for the atmosphere as well, which is electrifying. Yeah, yeah. You know, and exciting, beyond exciting, when you see so many hundreds of fans just so thrilled to see their heroes. Uh, that you know, it's just an, you know everyone feels the same. 
Yeah, I, I think you're right. It's, it's sometimes about the event, isn't it? Rather than sort of, oh, I'm not in the first couple of rows, I can't really see them. It's just a part of being there. It's sort of like a festival, isn't it? You know, if you only go to yeah, a festival, it it's more like the event. And yeah, it makes which, you feel good. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we've had this conversation before, but I know you've been to Glastonbury a few years ago. Did you enjoy that? I loved it. I was so blown away by the size. I mean, it's like going to a, a whole city. It was incredible. We walked around quite a lot, obviously. There was so much to see, so much on display. A lot of arts and crafts were being shown and different foods were around, different bands playing on really small stages as well as the big main stages. It was just full of just happy making events. And yeah. what I noticed is that everyone was smiling and happy and whole families with their children. Happy, happy, happy. I mean, it was just divine. Yeah, really. Mm. You do take that away. It's not all about, oh, who was the headlining act and who did you see? It's, it's the whole experience, isn't it? So the whole experience. The atmosphere was just buzzing. And also there was no hint of violence in the air. When I think of large groups of people like that, I used to be frightened that there could be somebody who's angry or uptight and disrupt the whole thing. But there was no feeling of that at Glastonbury at all. Yeah, I mean, sadly, the, the violence, we, there was that, you know, in, back in the day and certain, I think the Stones yeah. suffered, didn't they, with some, some issues they did. with their gigs. Yeah, back in they did. the late 60s, maybe. Magical Mystery Tour. We had several questions on this. It was quite interesting. Um, I'm sure you probably weren't directly involved with a lot of it because the, the, it was very much the boys' project. But um, someone's just asking your general opinion of it. So Magical Mystery Tour, as in the, the movie that was made, plus the, the album. Have you got much recollection or thought on that one? Uh, no, at the time, I remember thinking what a wonderfully fun idea this is. Uh, of them all dressing up and going, you know, the whole idea of just going on a bus on a mystery tour is exciting for anyone, I think. Yeah. And they made it look quite sort of psychedelic as well. And it was fun. It was just, um, I think it was more of John's imagination being played out. And I think I'm right, so there's a song called Blue Jay Way um, that George wrote, which is an address out in California. Can you tell us a bit about Blue Jay Way? Did you and George actually stop on Blue Jay Way? Were you there for a period of time? We were there for, I would say, about two months while George was recording and also checking out um, the tapes in the studio. And we took a house, a big house, a glorious Hollywood house with a big swimming pool. And it was on Blue Jay Way. And a lot of musicians would come and meet George and just drop by and say hello and it was a really wonderful sunny time it was great I think it might have even been one of our first stays in Los Angeles okay was that the same the same um, time when you did the famous walkabout in in uh, Hay Ashbury where no 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 a, I don't think so time. yeah I don't know I can't remember because a lot of that's a very famous sort of um story isn't it when someone gave George a guitar, an acoustic guitar and you guys were walking yes. around suddenly it was a bit like the Pied Piper there were hundreds of people following you around you know through Hay Ashbury. Yes yeah I don't know if we were staying in Blue Jay Way and then took a plane up to San Francisco we might have been I don't know. Yeah okay okay. Can't remember. Okay uh, next question is an interesting one Patty as well um, what are Patty's memories of Delaney and Bonnie? Now, I think <gasps> a question. I absolutely adored Delaney and Bonnie. I thought they were quite um, beautiful. I love the sound they make. I love their album. And um, they were captivating as, as a couple. Um, Eric really just fell in love with them. He thought they were divine. And he wanted to play with them. And um, he introduced George to them. So, I mean, they, they were really liked by those two and other musicians as well I know Ronnie Wood liked them a lot yeah and in fact they were doing a little tour of England and Eric decided that he would go on stage with them and he persuaded George to go on stage as well and this was in Liverpool 
Fantastic. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard about that as well. I think George really enjoyed that because he was more sort of in the background, wasn't he? You know, it was just a guest musician spot rather but than... But he was, spot. yeah, which he liked because it wasn't like going on stage with the rest of the Beatles where it would just be full on screaming. This was a new experience for him. Okay, and leading on from that quite nicely, uh, and we mentioned earlier 50th anniversaries of lots of things, 50th anniversary this year of a concert for Bangladesh that George organised. And we had a couple of questions about that as well in terms of, uh, the first one was just basically, was Patty there? Can, what can she remember about it? Did she enjoy it? So perhaps we could just pull those together, Patty, just say, what are your recollections of, of those concerts for Bangladesh that George organised? Oh my gosh, I'm so proud of George for organising this. He had become great friends with Ravi Shankar, who alerted him to the troubles in Bangladesh and the plight of the poor people there. And I think it was Ravi who suggested that George do something to raise some money to help. And um, George went into action, of course, and phoned up quite a lot of his musician friends, including Billy Preston. And... Um, thought that uh, they would play in Madison Square Gardens and it was fantastic I mean the place was completely packed and it went down really really well it was very exciting indeed yes absolutely do you remember the situation regarding John Lennon at that time because I don't know whether George wanted to invite him or, or John turned him down do you know the background to that one Patty no I can't remember I don't know if John was in New York then. I don't know where John was. No, he would have had his... What year was it, Tony? What year was it? 71. 71. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't again, know. Stories fly around. John was having his own troubles. Well, I guess the, the Beatles were still sort of wrangling a bit at that time. So might, might... Well, maybe, yes. Maybe the Beatles splitting up was still rather raw as far as yeah. John and George were concerned. And this was just going to be George, George's little, um, not little, but, you know, his contribution to helping raise money. A lot of people love the 60s, for example, as a decade. You know, it's much revered and much loved. And the question here is specifically regarding Marianne, Faithful and Donovan. Are you still in contact with those? Yes, I'm certainly in contact with Donovan. I saw him this last summer, actually, uh, and it was great to see him after not seeing him for years. And Linda, his wife, who has done the most beautiful book, and they sent me a copy of their book. And in return, I sent them a photograph I had taken of George when he and I were going to visit Donovan on the Isle of Skye. So I sent him a large print of that. Anyway, he was happy. So it was lovely to see him. And Marianne, I saw her last about, I don't know, maybe six years ago. Oh, wow. A friend of mine had a, a sort of like a little hotel in London and she was staying there. And he was having a big dinner. And uh, so it was lovely to see Marianne. And, and she and I just didn't stop talking. No one else at the table could, could talk to her. She and I were just straight in, Fantastic. chatting about the old days. It was great. And she's so gorgeous. And I, I, I'm aware that you, you're still in contact with people like Twiggy, maybe, and Lulu, you know. Oh, yes. Times. Yeah. It was so funny. The other day I was taking my dog for a walk. And um, usually I listen to... Twiggy's podcast. It's called Twi Tea with Twiggy. Yeah. So, and I wasn't listening to it this afternoon, and the phone rang, and it was Twiggy, and I said, oh, "Are you live? Oh, is this a podcast?" Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was great to talk to her. She doesn't live too far away from me, so we look forward to getting together this summer or whenever we're allowed out of lockdown. Yeah, yeah. I I, listen, I have heard one of those tea with Twiggy. It was a, a Ronnie Wood one, which was very entertaining. So yes, yeah, because you did the um, Sky Arts uh, program with Ronnie a few years ago, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. I did. Yeah, yeah. And yes. there in that program, I talk about Delaney and Bonnie. I think the whole musician um, situation, very, very tight knit family. The more I read about it and sort of learn about it, it's it's quite close knit, wasn't it? There's a lot of friendship between the musicians. Yeah, you're right, Tony. It was. And um, everybody seemed to love each other, well, embrace each other, because they all knew of each other's music. And so there was an immediate 
um, camaraderie and friendship. And it was, as you say, like one big family. Yeah. Did that sort of move, did that cross over with you all sort of having to keep a, a bit of a, 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 a close ranks, as it were, now and again, and sort of keep a veil of secrecy, or did that not have to happen very often? Um, no, not really. I, it was just, you know, the musicians and their girlfriends were in the group, as it were, the massive group. Yeah. And not many outside people came in unless they were attached to the band. Say if they were, you know, the, their managers or their roadies or they were very close to them in some way. OK, that leads me nicely into another question, which we'll treat as the last question. Um, could Patty tell us uh, recollections of Neil Aspinall and Mal Evans? Mal was the most lovely, big, giant teddy bear of a man. Always sweet, always there, ready to help anyone. And Neil uh, was more conservative and um, quieter. But the two of them made such a wonderful couple. Yeah, there's always a big question, who was the fifth Beatle? You know, and if they've got a few names, you could hang on that, you know, from Brian Epstein to George Martin, Neil, Mao, whoever. And I, I don't, it's not, it's not a fair question who was a fifth Beatle. All these guys were sort of very important to, within the process and within the circle, weren't they? You know, they're very close. They were, yeah. yes, yeah. Okay, Patty, thank you so much. There's, there's some great questions there i think you know very sort of um diverse selection we got there so thank you to everybody for sending those in if we didn't cover yours or the topic which you were writing we're sorry about that but it's as usual time constraints and all the rest of the bits and pieces but patty thank you again and um, we shall meet up again to do the next one in due course tony thank you so much for selecting some of the questions and it was lovely to talk to you and i just want to thank everybody for sending in wonderfully interesting questions for me to answer okay, uh, and so I say goodbye now <laughs>